When I was a child, there was a Soviet submarine parked at Pier 48 in Seattle, the closest city to where I grew up. There as a museum, though many would say it had rather poor taste in how it chose to express the information they were trying to put out there. And it's just one example of the many Soviet relics used as an often disrespectful and humorous thing to gawk at here in the States. Assalamu alaikum comrades, let's talk about Seattle's Soviet submarine and the mentality behind these sorts of tourist traps. So back behind me is Pier 48 where the submarine used to be, but there's really no way to get to where you used to unload onto it. It's just a parking lot now and a space to get to the Bainbridge Ferry. Where there was once a problematic museum. <laughs> there was a problematic museum. It's definitely gone downhill. I mean, for one, there's no Soviet submarine, but it's also just a desolate parking lot. And I should say at one point there was a building here and this was used for things, but it was torn down in 2010. But like Nirvana famously had a concert on this pier. I'm pretty certain when the submarine was here, it was on this side of the dock because from the pictures, you could see this tower in the background which was once the tallest building west of the Mississippi long ago, now clearly not so much. So from around 2002 to 2005, a 1972 Soviet submarine, a Foxtrot submarine, was parked at Pier 48, as I mentioned, which is just south of the Coleman Ferry Dock, if you know Seattle. If not, I, I, I get it, it's fine. I know that I'm being very local right now. So this submarine museum was called the Russian Cobra Submarine. There was a lot of interesting signage for it, though it's oddly hard to find remnants and photographs. So it got there because an attractions company based in Seattle purchased the sub in Vladivostok and towed it to Tacoma for cleaning, which is a city south of Seattle, and spent $1 million in restoration efforts up in Canada. They changed the name of the submarine to the Cobra because apparently it gave it a more warlike name. Ultimately, it wouldn't make much money or garner as much attention as they wanted, and it ended up being sold to the Maritime Museum in San Diego, which is why it hasn't been in Seattle since like 2005, 2006. It was actually members of local veterans groups that helped the restoration and lead the tours. These sorts of submarines carried out a lot of surveillance missions. Apparently, this particular submarine, decommissioned in 1994, had logs showing that the crew once trailed a Canadian destroyer off of Victoria. So there's some local history. At the time of the initial launch of the museum in 2002, tours cost $10 for adults and $6 for children and seniors. There was also an amateur radio operator club that met inside the submarine and use their equipment. I think that's how it went down. Seattle actually has a huge amateur radio hobby scene. But what did people have to say about this attraction? Because it was so long ago, the online accounts are limited, but there's some there. Because apparently it was quite insensitive, which might be why it didn't do well in a city like Seattle. We do have a lot of sites of Soviet-related history, not that they're profited off of or that the average citizen even knows they exist. But there is tons of history here they could have pulled from, but that's besides the point. One user remarks on roadsideamerica.com, quote, it's interesting touring the sub itself, but what makes it amusing is the pre-recorded narration provided by someone who sounds like a cross between Boris Badenov and Bella Lugosi. I'm 28 years old and I, I don't understand some of these references, I'm sorry. Some of the informational signs are surprisingly non-PC for this day and age. This is 2003 that this was written, so... Uh. For example, they compared the breeding habits of shipboard cockroaches to those of the Chinese. So that's the level of tour, educational tour we're dealing with here. Interesting. Interesting choices were made, huh? The signage, the tone the angle. Let's take a look at the website because you can look at that archived. So the website says the hunt is over. Visit the Russian Cobra at Pier 48 in downtown Seattle, Washington. Welcome aboard. Prepare for the experience of a lifetime. Tour the Russian attack submarine Cobra B-39. Take the time to tour the Cobra through these selected photos of her interior and equipment. 
So if you're into this kind of stuff, the interior is really cool. I did grow up with a father who was a nuke, so I have been inside an aircraft carrier uh, many times, and that definitely left an impact on me, aesthetic-wise. But as you can see, their symbol was this, you know, fake Soviet emblem with a cobra in the middle. The bad fake Cyrillic that spells out Russian cobra, but really it it's, does not say that in Cyrillic. Uh, and here on this page, there's a lot more history. Yeah, they really play into like the Cold War spy and mystery. The Cobra sailed out on its maiden voyage into the North Sea, where she then turned south for her secret journey down to the coast of Europe and Africa. Right? The missions undertaken by the Cobra are shrouded in secrecy, and remain so to this day. Still classified top secret. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think you get the feel for it. Oh, I did find an archived page of the guest book, so there's even more accounts. All caps, we took the tour <laughs> on 12 2 and really enjoyed it. This is a must-see in Seattle. The tour prices are reasonable. <laughs> this is, it doesn't seem like a real comment, I don't know. The Cobra is a wonderful treat to see. Not often one gets to see what a submarine from another country looks like. Thanks. And that's cool that there was an opportunity to look at Soviet equipment, regardless of the narrative and design. <laughs> so unfortunately, it does seem that as of 2021, the submarine, which then went on to live in San Diego at the Maritime Museum, has been sent to the scrapyard, which is really sad, but not unheard of. I'm not necessarily surprised. What value did it have to those giving the tour? What value did it have to the average American at a maritime museum. Was it really there because people genuinely wanted to learn about Soviet equipment, a true telling of Soviet history? Was it there to really be appreciated? Or was it there to simply make money at the expense of Cold War hysteria and curiosity? And that's a running theme in these types of tourist traps, these sorts of gimmicks. We see it in movies still perpetuated today. The Soviet spy, the Russian spy, the villains coded with a Eastern European accent. No one wants to visit a site of history involving the Soviet Union that isn't played up in this sort of evil villain, Cold War spy sort of way. And I say this because Seattle is full of many, many sites of wonderful history regarding the Soviet Union. There's Tashkent Park, commemorating the fact that Seattle was the first U.S. sister city to a Soviet city. The City of Seattle's Parks and Recreation describes Tashkent Park as a charming, shady neighborhood park with picnic tables, a wooden arbor, benches, and a sculpture. Tashkent Park was named for Tashkent, Uzbekistan, one of Seattle's international sister cities. It's not only the sister city of Tashkent, but the very first U.S. sister city to a Soviet city. The lack of mentioning this really important factor could be reflected in how unkempt and forgotten this park is. It's in a disastrous state. It's full of broken tiles originally made by school children in the Soviet Union and the US saying cute things like USSR and USA peace in both Russian and English. It's a time capsule that deserves to be preserved. This is my favorite park in Seattle due to its historic significance, but even the Seattle Wiki describes this park as known by locals as trash can park where there's some grass and free wi-fi it deserves to be known as something more than that it's rarely taken care of the tiles are often broken despite being a wholesome reminder of what could have been why is that park not upkept why was that not part of this soviet tourist trap we have our linen statue which is continuously attacked <laughs> vandalized though luckily it's very hard to vandalize something so large and solid our infamous 1919 Great Seattle Strike, and long history of having one of the largest union memberships in the country, at least back in the day. Many notorious Soviet sympathizers came from the Pacific Northwest, and our reputation was so bad that in 1936, then Postmaster General of the United States, James Farley said, there are 47 states in the union and the Soviet of Washington. That's been our reputation, and we don't learn about it today, it's not taught in our schools. People who grew up here their whole lives don't know these connections and are surprised when I bring up, and there's many, many more. And it's important to think about why. <laughs> why? They're not sensational. 
In fact, they're not sensational and they're sympathetic. It shows a long-standing history of sympathy and understanding for the working man against the bourgeoisie and aligned with the Soviet Union here locally. And that doesn't play out well for our, our booming tech industry, Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, Funko Pop, all our local businesses taking over our major cities and pushing out locals from being able to afford even studio apartments here in Seattle. It's really, really bad. It's, it's strange. You never find people who grew up here. <laughs> oh, Dustia has graced us. <laughs> what do you think of Jeff Bezos? suspiciously quiet. My point is, there's reason why money and attractions, museums, so on and so forth, the reason why they focus on certain things like playing up Cold War stereotypes instead of the actual sympathetic history that we have here locally, the reason why that's what makes money and that's what businessmen want to focus on, it's just telling of the state of the United States and those that have the money to create these sorts of exhibits, I suppose. I'm always shocked every year that there's never any sort of celebration or remembrance for the 1919 strike. No one ever talks about the Red Scare and how that hit our state. There were many UW professors that were put on a show trial for being potentially communists or formally associated with the Communist Party, other than Chaz, Chop, whatever you want to call it, the Capitol Hill, Autonomous Zone, Occupied Protest. I know some of you don't want to acknowledge that that existed, but uh, it happens. Only a year after the anniversary would, would have been the 1919 strike, though both of them gave us great examples of how not to do things. I feel like people could have learned from the strike a hundred years ago how the fact that they chose not to get didn't help. I shouldn't, I shouldn't explore that. That'll get me in trouble. I have my opinions. Let's say that. What I'm saying is why not create museums based off of the sympathetic history? We know why. We know why. We discussed this. But it's frustrating to me that people like you or me don't have the funds to open a museum that could highlight all these awesome histories at an affordable price to the general public, if not free. It's part of why I do what I do, so people can learn these things. But yeah, that submarine was just an oddity. I had never been on it. I was aware of it. I would forgotten about it for many years. And sadly, as you saw, you can't even go out to where it was. It was kind of out of the way, honestly. And today, it's just for traffic onto the ferry. But even that negative Cold War history, it's completely erased from Pier 48. And there's hardly any trace of it on the internet. Have any of you visited that submarine back between 2002 and 2005? Do you locally have any other similar museums that are just hyping up Cold War hysteria? When I was temporarily staying in Arizona, I visited the uh, Titan Missile Silo, and that was pretty cool. When they were giving the tour, uh, they mentioned how they had the missiles pointed at two locations, two secret locations, and they asked everyone, can you uh, tell us where you think those were pointed? <laughs> My husband raised his hand with his, you know, Russian accent and was like, uh, Moscow, and I, don't know, I forget what else he said. And the, the guy giving the tour was like, well, no, it was, the thing is, we don't know where it was pointed at, huh? And it's like, yeah, you do. He was probably right. Tell, okay, come on. That was cool. But I feel like a missile silo makes more sense to tour than a submarine. I don't know. But even then, like, it, it all played into the paranoia. It's almost as if you show people the actual thing, it justifies their fear and paranoia. So I don't know how I would have set it up, but just, just some things to think about. Um, let me know if you want me to show you any of those other things that I mentioned locally here, the local history. There's quite a few interesting events and things that happened regarding the Soviet Union here in my city. I just don't know how interested you guys are in things relating to the US instead of just the Soviet Union. But there's lots of things to explore regarding that. I don't know. Tell me what you think. Hopefully you understood my musings here. And if you want to support me, you can become a patron of mine on Patreon, where I post these videos usually a couple days, sometimes a week early for you to watch ahead of time. It's also just a good way to support me consistently. You can also send me a one-time donation on my PayPal, or you can just share what I do here and say something nice down below. 
and defend me from the mean people because I'm sensitive. All right, be inspired by history. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>